where you can find our schedules there. Also, I'd like people to move forward. We need to keep about a third of the sidewalk, certainly everything behind the tree open for the passers-by. Anyone who would like to sit down, please do so. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Eden. Well, as I said, for those of you who are new, my name's Kevin Gallagher. I uh, teach at Boston <laughs> University. I want to thank all of you for uh, for waking everybody up. You know, I, I'm an old dude. I wake up in the morning, I read the paper, I get grumpy, and I think a lot of Americans did too. We were just sitting here getting grumpy and getting depressed and so forth. And you folks said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go out there, and this thing is swelling on a weekly basis, and it's, it's great to see. So thank you for doing it, and thank you for having us to come out here and, uh, and talk about it. I want, to, I want to talk about two things and pick up on, on something that Mark, uh, Mark has been talking about. And we, we've got to be a little, we've got to be really careful about what some of our targets are. Um, and I want to talk about two targets um, and talk about their global, global implications. Um, I want to talk about credit rating agencies and trade treaties. These are two things that Wall Street has totally taken over for their benefit to accentuate and globalize this bait and switch that Mark has been talking about uh, for the last 10 minutes. So first, let's start with the, with the credit rating agencies. What, what are the credit rating agencies? Anyone know what the credit rating agencies are? They're agencies that rate certain uh, economic uh, entities, like bonds, stocks. Sure, they're Wall Street-based, or there's one in the UK, there's uh, Wall Street-based agencies that rate, they put stamps of approval on financial instruments, or bonds and debt instruments and so forth. And it's a big competitive market, right? There's, what, 100, 200, 300 of these companies so that they all keep other in check? Is that right? No, there's actually three of them that really matter in the entire world. There are three major credit rating agencies that basically determine what is a good investment and what is not a good investment on the private side, meaning private uh, debt instruments, and government debt and governments. <coughs> they became famous for the mistakes that they made here in the United States in the private sector when it came to these collateralized debt obligations, right? The Wall Street firms uh, took the mortgages of the 99%, packaged them all together, and sold them to the 1% in the world to play around with and bet against and bet for. And when all that dried up or when the housing market collapsed, all that crashed down and the uh, the stamp of approval that made these instruments that they made on the backs of all of our mortgages, they were seen as investment grade, triple A, perfect stuff, never going to fall apart. That was stamped by the credit rating agencies. Okay, The Dodd-Frank bill tried to uh, make some, uh, originally, when in the original hearings, the, the credit rating agencies were one of the main focal points of the bill. Now when you take a look at it, they're hardly there. Why? Because they are ultra-powerful. Where do the credit rating agencies get their money to do this stuff? If you're an interested investor, you call up a credit rating agency and you give them money and they write a report for you about a, an industry or a particular instrument or a country that you might be uh, interested in investing in. Is that the case? No, they actually get paid by the companies that they rate the bonds for. So, an example, JP Morgan is going to float some bonds for a particular industry or a company in the United States, they pay Standard & Poor's or Moody's to rate that bond. They get the money from the company that is going to benefit or not benefit from that rating. And so there's an absolute conflict of interest. And it wasn't like that after the New Deal. In the original sense of the credit rating agencies, they were like my first hypothetical example where individual investors would hire them to do research on another company. So it took that conflict of interest out. The conflict of interest is right there. The second terrible thing about the credit rating agencies is that, guess what? People get mad about them all the time. They were played a core role in the meltdown of the United States, and there's been lawsuits all over the country against the credit rating agencies because people who lost their jobs in Ohio and so forth, guess what? The one thing they had to hold on to was their pension. But the United States government requires that pensions have to be secured and have bonds and so forth that are AAA rated by the credit rating agencies. So all these people that were unemployed went to their governments. The state of Ohio tried to sue Moody's. The state of Wisconsin tried to sue Standard & Poor's. They win, the credit rating agencies win every case. How come? Legally, they are winning 
by claiming that they are nothing different than the opinion page of the Boston Globe or the Occupy Boston Globe. That they are just providing opinions for pay. So they win all these cases on the First Amendment. The Dodd-Frank bill tried to, tried to wrinkle some of this stuff, but in the end, the lobbyists kind of watered it out. There's a little bit of it in there, but it's up to regulators to go implement those rules, and those are the exact rules in Dodd-Frank that the Republicans in every single one of their uh, uh, debates is trying to cut. Right? They say Dodd-Frank is terrible. It's far from perfect, but it's the only thing that we've got right now. Third thing about credit rating agencies is that they're global. Right? They do this all over the world, and they also pick off countries. With the money that they get from private firms, they also do research on other countries and the quality of their debt. And they have an algorithm when they decide whether or not a country's debt are, is good or bad based on austerity economics that comes out of what, what Mark is talking about. If you are going to spend money for social programs and so forth and float debt for it, they don't like that. So they'll warn you and say, we'll downgrade your debt. They did this after the financial crisis all over the world. India, which wasn't really affected as much by the crisis because they wouldn't take some of these toxic assets uh, from the United States, uh, they did have a slowdown in demand. And so they were going to go into a little bit of a debt for a short period of time to put in an expansionary policy to try to get some jobs going in the economy back. Well, the digital helicopters of the credit rating agencies hovered over and said, if you pass that bill, we're going to downgrade your debt, and then it'll be harder for you to raise the money to put those programs in. And so countries like India took a step back and decided not to expand their economy. So they are unofficially, these three, three private corporations, unofficially also can make major decisions about countries, <laughs> employment, environmental, and social problems in order to get out of the crisis and so forth. And it gets ten times worse when there's an actual crisis. So we've got this crisis in the Eurozone right now, right? And maybe in the next month or so, I hope not, uh, we'll have a Lehman Brothers moment with Greece. Well, all these countries have been trying to scramble to deal with this bait and switch that, uh, that Mark talked about. In the Irish case, their banks borrowing money left and right. Oh, the banks were in big trouble. Ireland had a pretty good fiscal situation, but they bailed out the banks. Now Ireland's in trouble. All right, uh, they got their debt down graded for that. That made them even in worse trouble. So what do they do? Their leaders, the European Central Bank, the European Parliament, the International Monetary Fund, they stay up all night like you guys do for two weeks straight to hammer out a deal. I didn't like the deal, but it, it's a, it was a, a quasi-democratic possible deal to try to say, hey, let's get the, let's get this government back off, uh, back off the floor and get it moving again. In a, in a manner that the people aren't going to totally revolt and the people are going to share are going to share some of the burden, but not all of it. They signed the deal on Sunday night, one o'clock in the morning. Monday morning, Moody's downgrades their debt, and the entire two weeks of staying up all night and negotiating this stuff unravels, and markets retreat from Ireland. Same thing happened in Portugal. Same thing happens about every other week in Greece. All right, that's the third concern about the credit rating agencies. Temperature check. We like the credit rating agencies. Okay. Second thing, trade treaties. Right? Trade treaties, we think international trade treaties are really about shoes, about cars, right? We're going to sell cars to Korea. They're going to sell cars to us. Well, while we weren't looking, yeah, they've got that stuff in it, but tariffs all around the world are actually pretty low on all this stuff. Well, we weren't looking. Trade treaties, the other 400 pages of these things, have these huge chapters on financial services. And the financial services chapters of U.S. trade treaties export the Wall Street model across the world. They make it mandatory for another country to have to allow our Wall Street firms that are doing all this stuff to move and buy out their companies and their banks and to set up shop there and to allow money to come in and out with freely and without delay in case any, you know, and they can't restrict at all. If the country, after the trade treaty, decides to put in a regulation like Dodd-Frank, or even better, like Glass-Steagall, the private U.S. firm can directly sue the government of the other country to repeal that law. There are three bills that Obama put to the U.S. Congress this week, one with Colombia, one with South Korea, and one with Panama, that all export the Wall Street model to all three of those countries. I don't care if, you know, I hope you care about all these countries, but even if you don't, the more that happens, the more it's going to affect us. 
right? The more Wall Street is globalized and it has allowed to have these policies around the world, the more unstable global markets are going to become and the more it's going to come back to get us. Temperature check on U.S. trade treaties? Oh. I think it's important to start getting specific about some of the kinds of things that we're the most concerned about and how they're manifest in different instruments and different policies and different pieces of legislation. Mark talked about this austerity economics and the Glass-Siegel Act. I want you to focus on credit rating agencies and, uh, and U.S. trade treaties. And unfortunately, U.S. trade treaties are the ones that every other country tries to copy because they want to be like us. And so these things are becoming more and more globalized. I want to thank you again for coming out and inviting me. Uh, thank you for educating yourself on all this stuff. I'm a professor, so i got to give you homework. One inspiring book is a book called The Coming of the New Deal by Arthur Schlesinger. The guy had a high school education and wrote the greatest uh, book about the New Deal. It's a book about what the United States did the last time this happened. The last time this happened, Roosevelt came into office. They slapped the Glass-Steagall Act in there. They re-regulated all of Wall Street. And we had unprecedented growth in living standards, uh, reduction of inequality, bringing different parts of the American public in, and raising up living standards from the 1940s until 1980, when Wall Street started to come into this. And uh, that's your homework until the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.